What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Welcome back to America Trends. Larry Rifkin along with John Kropsik. And John, there are many things that take place uh, that uh, you and I, if we really were able to pull them out, examine them under a microscope, we would say, what an awful practice this or that is. But we kind of go along blithely and uh, we accept these things because, well, we see them with such regularity that they don't really stand out to us until there's a study that comes along and says, do you know what this organization or this company is doing to sell their products? Now, what products are we talking about well, here? Well, we're really talking about food. Okay. Manufactured, processed, food. sugary, Tricks are addictive. For kids. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. So we laugh. Oh, this is fun. Isn't this fun? And yet, meanwhile, we're hooking a lot of kids who are very unsuspecting, and uh, they're then demanding to their parents as they sit in their shopping carts, Mom, I want this, I want that. And we don't realize how targeted and effectively zoned in many of these ads are to get these kids well, to only, ask for these not products. Not only the ads, but the stores are, are designed to put the stuff right at ah, eye level. where the kids can so get them. Where they and get really it. actually exactly. pull them right off exactly. the shelves. Exactly. No, you're mean, absolutely you know, right. There's a whole science here <laughs> well it's marketing from production to distribution and everybody knows the game they know how it's played and they've been doing it for years but one of the more insidious aspects to all of this is you and i have talked about food deserts in urban areas right. where black and hispanic kids just don't have access to some of the same or, or that's all they can afford exactly exactly and why is it that a vegetable or fruit can't be made as inexpensive as some of these, well, chemically designed products right. that are meant to addict kids no, at an early age. It's really a sad situation we got there. And, you know, we come from the state of Connecticut, John and I. We're still here, and we're very proud of the University of Connecticut. And, John, I don't know if you know this, but there is a group in Connecticut at UConn, uh, the Rudd Center that deals with all kinds of issues related to food policy in America. And luckily for us, we were able to get a hold of Jennifer Harris, who was the lead author on a study that looked at the fact that junk food ads are targeted very expressly toward black and Hispanic kids in wow. America. Well, I, didn't, I know they were targeted. I didn't realize it was, it was a... a you know, a demographic, how they broken it down that far. But well, as I, know, saying, I, know, yeah. I know children are, are targeted for this stuff. Absolutely. And in this case, we're talking about kids who really oftentimes may be in front of a television set unattended. Uh, they watch a little bit more television than some of the kids in the suburban areas who are using their computers and more digital technology. And we're not talking necessarily about the youngest among us, because I think many of you may have read that uh, there are limits and prescriptions that are put on this. And there are packs that have been made with many of these marketers, John, of these food products. So so as not to go after the youngest in the audience. But then again, let's be reminded, John, that when an older kid in the household is watching a program, the there's younger a younger kid too. right by their side enjoying that program. Let's exactly. be honest. Now that's true. They do watch up. So there is this study that has been done about how black and Hispanic kids see TV ads for these sugary, unhealthy snacks, sodas, fast food, far more than for anything else. Wow. And is that really what we want to see no, happen? No, that's it's terrible. And that the sugary drinks and stuff is awful for them. And it, it makes them also, it makes them tough to, to sit in school and stuff. So, I mean, it creates a lot of problems. Sugar is bad. 
And uh, it's fascinating, and we will talk about it with Jennifer, about how various companies like Coca-Cola and General Mills, McDonald's, and they know what they're doing. I mean, these folks are very, very smart. They know what sells more product. They know how to speak to various audiences about what they're doing. And yet, I don't think they want us to think that this is a calculated strategy on their part. They'll go into schools and they'll donate... uh something to the school and in return they get their machine in there ah yes <laughs> and they're not promoting a lot of their healthy choices no. uh, to the same young cohort so they could be offering Dasani uh, water they could be doing a lot of other things uh, and sometimes they'll put out a message you know don't drink too much don't eat too much don't do this <laughs> meanwhile they're shoving all this other messaging right at these young kids so let's go to the authority the Rudd Center for food policy and obesity and find out what the heck is going on here as it relates to getting these messages directly to these young people most susceptible in our society. We're going to do that next here on America Trends. Joining us on the line is Jennifer Harris. She is the lead author and director of marketing initiatives at the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity at the University of Connecticut. What are the issues that you're studying at the Rudd Center? Well, at the Rudd Center, our mission is to promote solutions to childhood obesity, poor diet, and weight bias through research and policy. That's very succinct. I know that uh, in the course of doing that, you've got to be looking at all kinds of issues in our culture today. And one that you looked at that uh, really caught my attention was the idea that a lot of the junk food, if we'll call it that, ads are really targeted in a very specific way toward black and Hispanic young people. How important an issue is this, given the fact that many of the poor people or, or those young people in those communities actually are living in food deserts and don't have access to a lot of food options? Yeah, this is, this is a, a hugely important issue for a number of reasons. As you mentioned, they, they don't have access to healthy food options, but Sometimes it's called a food swamps where they live because they have food access, but it's all, you know, fast food and very unhealthy options. The people living in those communities also have higher rates of obesity and diabetes and and heart disease and other diet-related diseases. Unfortunately, those are the same communities that companies have decided they're going to target their marketing to and the products they're targeting with them with are fast food, sugary drinks, candy, and um, unhealthy snacks. So the same products that are contributing to the, those poor diet and related diseases. A lot of people, when we think of things that are too big, uh, and maybe that are failing us, uh, big pharma, big mm-hmm. medicine at times. And I have often on my radio program and as part of the podcast uh, series talked about big food. And I don't think people really think about the food product industry in the way that I might, which is that I go down a grocery aisle and generally most of these things are conceived of not in nature, not in soil, but in somebody's uh, food laboratory and their imagination, which is meant to really well, addict us in many ways. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, and, and it's unfortunate, but when we talk about marketing to kids, what I hear all the time is, well, you know, it's not bad that they're marketing to kids, but, you know, why it's bad that they're marketing unhealthy food to kids, but why don't they just market healthy food to kids? <laughs> and, you know, that sounds like a great solution, but the fact is that these companies don't have healthy products. They're, they're selling processed food. They're not selling fruits and vegetables and whole grain products and things that children should be consuming more of. So really their bottom line is invested in encouraging kids to eat products that are not good for them. Now, do we think that this targeting of the uh, products that we're talking about here in terms of ads, sugary drinks, uh, the fast food, the unhealthful snacks, which made up a preponderance of the uh, targeted messages going to the African-American and Hispanic young children. Mm -hmm. Do we think this was purposeful, intentional, or could there have been some, well, mistake? Well, 
Well, I don't think it was a mistake. I I don't. You know, I was being I don't somewhat have, facetious. <laughs> I don't have access to companies' marketing, proprietary marketing plans, so I don't know what their intention is. You know, I think there's probably several things going on here. I think one is that that for some reason they've they've found that consumers are are buying their products, which you know sort of means which really creates a vicious circle. So, you know, if they want to target people who are already buying or who are buying their products, then it just makes that makes them want to buy more because that's why they're advertising. It's also it, it's it's a it's a matter of access, like you said, what fast food comp, you know, what products are easily available that they can buy in their neighborhoods. It's fast food corner stores with junk food. Um, and so, you know, it's easy for them to purchase these products, which is another reason you might want to advertise to them. We also know that black kids in particular consume more media overall, uh, especially television. So if if they're advertising on television, on youth targeted programs, black kids are going to see more of those ads than white kids. But on top of that, what we see is a few companies that seem to have specifically decided to to target black or or hispanic audiences and and the way we know that is if we look at how much money they're spending on targeted television mm-hmm. and then we look at what percentage of their total budget it, it is for example mars spent 90 million dollars in spanish language advertising in 2017 and it and it made up Thirty percent of their total advertising budget. Well, they have clearly decided that this is an important target for them because no other company is spending as much or as high a proportion of their budget. Similarly, when we look at black targeted television, Hershey and PepsiCo spend more money than any other company on black targeted television and also invest a higher percentage of their total budget. Hershey and PepsiCo have, have clearly decided that black audiences are an important market for them. So there is, you know, several things going on. And I guess the the other thing is that when we look at healthy products, companies aren't advertising healthy products here to anyone. It represents fruits, vegetables, wad, plain water, nuts, represent only 3% of all advertising spending across the board, but they represent an even smaller amount of advertising. in the Well, I, I want to get so. at the issue of the ages that we're talking about here, because yeah. if I recall, and this goes back a few years, there's this Children's uh, Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, which I know right. is voluntary and it's run through the uh, Better Business Bureau and companies pledge that they will advertise only foods that meet various nutritional criteria in advertising to children under 12. And I know in some of the reporting that I've read of late in preparing to uh, talk with you today, they're suggesting that they're following that uh, dictum. So who are we talking to here, or are they not being as accurate in their uh, retelling of what they're doing with their advertising dollars? When we talk about the self-regulation, what we're talking about really bottom line is advertising on children's television programs. So what the food companies have said is that they will only advertise healthier dietary choices on programming where children make up more than 35% of the audience. And children are identified as 12 and under? Children under 12, Uh 11 and younger. Okay. So there are so many loopholes in those pledges. Well, first of all, their definitions of healthy is not what a nutritionist would call healthy. So Kool-Aid can still advertise and, you know, Lunchables and, you know, things like that that really aren't healthy choices. So that's number one. Number two is Children don't just watch children's television programs, cartoons. They watch a lot of other things. And and number three is, yeah, any any child 12 years and older, they consider free, free game. They can market anything they want to someone 12 and older. And when we're looking at the targeted, the, what 
what's targeted to black and Hispanic youth, it's mostly te- teenagers that they're marketing those, these products to. And I know you're very concerned that a lot of these young people, and I don't know at what age we're talking, uh, they get hooked on a lot of these unhealthy products, and that will stay with them for many years. I mean, a lot of their tastes and a lot of the things that they end up loving for a lifetime uh, start at a very young age. Do we know when that really starts? I mean, if you have a craving for sweets at three, are you destined to have it at 50 or what have you? You know, we don't know nearly enough about that, as we should. But some tastes, like preferences for sweet and salt, do develop at a very young age, like two or age two or three. And by the time these children, you know, hit kindergarten, they already have these preferences strongly developed. I mean, that doesn't mean they can't change, but it's difficult to change after that point. I think the other thing to understand is that the, the products that are advertised you know, as I think you alluded to earlier, are, are you know they're they're designed to be addictive in a way to really hit those taste reward circuits. In, in oh, the brain, Jennifer, you, know, you don't have to be shy the... about that. I met a gentleman <laughs> who was a scientist of food, and he told me. Mm-hmm. I mean, the testing that goes into some of this stuff to make certain that it is going to be savory and something that we crave. Right. I mean, you know, this is a science all unto itself. Right. It is, and then on top of that, the advertising really makes these products even more appealing. Oh, I can just see right now. uh, I mean, I remember an ad I saw recently, and it was for this new element that they're adding to a Big Mac, McDonald's, which, by the way, I'm reading, uh uh, is the uh, largest uh, advertiser as it relates to the Hispanic uh, young child. But this looks so delicious, and they were making a Big Mac into, I don't know, an entire meal plus <laughs> and, and you know right. now they make it look so good i mean the photography around it is just uh, almost impossible to avert right. your eyes from the advertising even without the images affects taste preferences so if there's been some really interesting studies showing that if someone child or adult sees an ad for a product and they enjoy th- that they haven't tried before and they like the ad, it's going to make them think that product tastes even better. So <laughs> it, it affects their, their expectations about what they think the product will taste when they try it, and it makes it even more appealing to them. You know, and, and on top of that, it's very um, effective. You know, when you're talking about teenagers, there's, there's a cool factor, right? Things like Gatorade are, are, are seen as, you know, if I'm a if I'm an athlete, I need to drink Gatorade. If Doritos are fun and sort of, you know, edgy, and so that makes Doritos really appealing. So there's a lot of science, but then there's also psychology involved in making these products. Oh, attractive. absolutely. Jennifer Harris is with us. She's the lead author and director of marketing initiatives at the Rudd Center, where they look at food policy and obesity. And, of course, we're talking about a study that was just done about junk food ads targeted to black and Hispanic children. And you've been doing some longitudinal work in this area. And uh, it was very uh, concerning to me to see that when we look at the research you did in 2015 and compare it four years later, uh, the situation's gotten decidedly worse. Yes, that's true, especially when looking at what product uh, uh, marketing targeted to black youth. And I guess what's especially disappointing about that is if you look at the companies and these food companies' annual reports, their statements in the press, they're all talking about developing health and wellness um, initiatives and, you know, encouraging healthier dietary, you know, healthier products, developing new products that are healthier but none of that is being marketed to communities of color. It's all, you know, it's still the, the, worst, the worst stuff. So they're saying great things, but when it comes down to what products they're really pushing, 
it's, it's gotten worse. And uh, you, of course, remind us in something that I read you said early on when this report came out is that uh, disproportionately a lot of the issues that are related to eating this uh, kind of food or food product, um, the results, obesity and uh, hypertension and the like, are disproportionately seen in a lot of these poor communities made up of uh, minority children. Absolutely. You know, health disparities that that we see in communities of color, especially the uh, poor communities, is they, they have shorter lifespans than people living in wealthier areas just because of the neighborhood they live in. But yet there are so many of these companies, I think, who have gotten people believing that they are offering better options, better alternatives, and that they're putting marketing dollars behind them. But the truth is that they're still producing a lot of things that are not healthy, and a lot of their marketing dollars are directed toward those products. I think the one that uh, I saw reference was the Dasani water product versus some of the other products that were made by Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola doesn't advertise its Dasani water, period. <laughs> I mean, they, they have that product. It's in the grocery store, but they're not advertising it. Well, the Yale School of Public Health, and of course you're at the University of Connecticut, uh, you're both in the state of Connecticut, and I read uh, a professor at the Yale School saying the truth of the matter is the companies have plenty of opportunity to self-police and self-regulate, and over and over again we're seeing it just doesn't work. So where do we go from here if, in fact, uh, there's a lot of um, you know uh, flag waving saying, look what we're doing, and we've got this voluntary initiative, and yet really when you look at where the advertising dollars are spent, knowing where these communities of color and young people are, and they're very susceptible to the messaging, and the messaging is very powerful, where do we go from there? I mean, it's really a tough call, and I, I would just want to add that they're not just marketing in those communities, but they're investing in scholarships, they're supporting playgrounds and sports teams, and, you know, sponsoring youth groups and putting a lot of money in the communities as well as, you know, that in a way that benefits the communities as well as marketing to them. And unfortunately, there's no one else that's investing in these communities. Corporations marketing healthy products are not investing in these communities. And so it really, it makes it difficult because you know, we've talked to people in the communities and, and you know, they'll, they'll say, well, if I have the choice of having a playground or a sports team, a youth sports team sponsored by Pepsi or no playground, I mean, I'm going to take the Pepsi spot money. I, I, you know, no one else is giving me money to support my playground. So we hear the same thing when talking about media that, you know, for for years and years and years, companies didn't advertise to black or Hispanic audiences. They didn't think they were important consumers. Well, now they're advertising there and they're supporting these media, these black media or, or Spanish media. And if they weren't advertising there, then there might not be a BET or, or a, a Univision to, if people didn't want to advertise there. So it really... You know, it's it's almost like, you know, they're buying them off, basically. So the change has to come from within the communities. And one thing that we're starting to see is people in these neighborhoods saying, I don't want, you know, this isn't right. Like Pepsi or Coca-Cola does have healthy products. You know, they we should be demanding that they sponsor with those products or not. But it's it's very difficult to to change. It's, it's, and it can't come from the outside the communities. It has to come from inside the communities. And I think, and one of the reasons we did this report was to really highlight how bad the situation is. I mean, people, a lot of people think, well, you know, they, yeah, I see ads for water and, you know, so, but they don't realize how lopsided the advertising is and, and, you know, how companies, directly going after these poor communities. And, and, I, and, you know, I think that with more awareness of what's happening, that 
change will start to happen. That's our hope anyway. Well, what is the value? I, I mean, I think this reporting is really important for us to see what is going on. But after your first report back in 2015, some of those initiatives that you're talking about, the yeah. corporate responsibility initiatives to promote health and wellness, as well as those sponsorships that you were talking about, that was born out of at least um, <laughs> an identification of what was going on and maybe to kind of paper yeah. over some of the concerns yeah. or guilt, if you will. But since then, of course, overall food-related spending on black television programming aimed at a black audience grew by 50%. Uh, and so I'm wondering what happened there. I mean, and what do you hope will happen as a result of the new reporting? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And, you know, the, when our first report came out, to be honest, we didn't get a whole lot of attention to it. Everyone was like, well, yeah, so what? Everyone knows this. But when this report came out, we have started getting a lot of people appalled at what they're seeing. And so I think there may be some bigger awareness now of what companies are doing and the harm that they may be causing. I think there may be a, you know, it may be sort of at the point where public awareness is starting to to understand and people are starting to to think, well, well, what are the options here? I mean, I guess we could get to the options. I guess we could get to a point where beyond, I know that there have been some limitations uh, beyond even the voluntary ones for the very young in terms of uh, advertising placement. I remember Peg Charon uh, from ACT Act uh, for Children's Television, and she was always beating the drum about uh, the commercialization of children's programming. So I know that there have been these efforts. Then I'm aware that there are things like sugar taxes and the like to try to you know, regulate uh, what it is that kids are um, consuming. Uh, you know, so what are the efforts that uh, may be undertaken? Is it about the messaging or is it about the product itself or the access to it? Uh, are there some things that you think you see going on across the country that might lead us out of this uh, wilderness, if you will, uh, where kids are really, I mean, they're very susceptible. Mm-hmm. These messages are yes. so powerfully and effectively crafted. Uh, it's so hard for them and their young brains not to go to mommy or daddy and say, that's what I want. I mean, we did a, a report on this a couple of years ago. Things have definitely improved on children's television. There's a lot less food advertising, The even though there's still unhealthy some unhealthy products, not nearly as many as there used to be. So when we're looking at children's television, which is really where the the self-regulation focus, there have been improvements. But unfortunately, that's not all the the marketing that kids are seeing. They're seeing it in so many other places. So it's kind of like, you know, we got one, you know, one (laughs) small part of what they're seeing. Oh, I was going to say that the sugary drink taxes that have been proposed and are being enacted you know, really, it's a revenue source, and lots of states and municipalities need money. So that that makes the tax appealing, and it can be used for things like universal preschool, like it, it, it was in Philadelphia. So that's, you know, one reason taxes are attractive to legislators. But on the other hand, they're also very, very effective at reducing consumption of sugary drinks, and there's more and more data coming out showing that. And the younger people who are more price sensitive are affected even more because for them, you know, those extra, you know, quarter or 50 cents on their soda is a lot, you know, more money for them than for older people. So research on target marketing has been very helpful for those advocates because it's showing that the lower income people who are drinking more of the soda are also being targeted by these companies more. And that has helped them get the message across that it's not about just choice. You know, it's not about limiting your choices. These companies are specifically in your neighborhood marketing these products that are making your kids sick. You know, this is a way to to counteract that. So I think, again, that, that kind of information is helpful for advocates and for people to understand understand what's going on. In closing, I think a lot of people should understand how much children, young children, 
love to age up when it comes to their television yes. viewing. And if there's an older child in uh, the audience and watching, they'll watch whatever their older sibling is watching. So they are very vulnerable and susceptible to messages that perhaps were not directly intended for them, but are reaching them. Well, I really want to thank you today, Jennifer Harris, uh, for being with us from the Rudd Center. If people want more information or would like to read the entirety of this report, how can they do that? They can go to our website, yukonrudcenter.org slash food marketing, and there's lots of resources there. Okay, thank you so much for being with us today on America Trends. Thank you for having me. Hey, Larry. Yeah, what's up, I've got some exciting news for you. Well, let's hear it. We're part of the MHNR Network. And where can we find that? That's MHNRnetwork.com. I'm going there right now. All right.